Every town has a dark side. In the northern portion of Maine, there are endless, pristine forests where the landscape is marked by raging rivers and large lakes. It's long been a place that people like to go, specifically in the summer when the temperatures are just right to enjoy the great outdoors. Up here you can enjoy it all. There's great places to camp, hunt, fish, and hike. I personally spent a few summers up there at camp growing up, canoeing down the Allagash River that stretches for 65 miles. And I have vivid memories of how beautiful it was and canoeing right past a giant moose that was just chilling in a calm part of the river. We were no more than 15 feet away from it because it was a narrow portion. The moose would dunk its head underneath the surface Flies swarm above, only to land on his head when he popped back up. As you're moving down the river, and this is just the kind of stuff you see, and the memories you take away from trips just like this. That's exactly why a group of college friends decided to head up to that area, the Allagash Wilderness, back in 1976. They were looking for inspiration and relaxation, and so they planned a two-week excursion. However, Something very unexpected happened when just two days in, they saw something very strange in the sky. And when it returned a few days later, it would change their lives forever. Hey guys, it's Andrew, and thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Everytown, where today we're headed to Maine, which, as you may know, has been dubbed Vacation Land, and for good reason as that's exactly what our subjects headed there to do one summer almost 50 years ago. Their story has been named the Allagash Abduction Incident, and it is perhaps one of the more famous stories of a first-hand alien encounter to ever occur in the United States. There are as many skeptics as there are believers to this story, but one thing's for sure, it's a very interesting and frightening mystery, the details of which are out of this world. In late August of 1976, four young men living in Massachusetts decided to take a break, make their way up to northern Maine for a camping getaway. That time of year is awesome weather up there, the forests are expansive and there's plenty of rivers and lakes to fish in, so that was the plan. Some good old fashioned American fun of camping and fishing, spending the nights underneath the stars. The guys on this trip were two brothers, Jack and Jim Weiner, and their friends, Chuck Rake and Charlie Foltz. They all met while they were attending the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, which was located in the heart of Boston, close to the museums and Fenway Park. Looking to get away from the hustle and bustle of that city life, they planned on a 14-day trip to the north before classes got underway in September. Not only would it be a chance for them to recharge their batteries, but they were also looking to find some creative inspiration among Mother Nature. So they packed up a little gear they had and headed up to the Allagash Wilderness, which covers thousands of acres at the very top of Maine. After about a seven hour drive, they found themselves at Eagle Lake, which actually connects to four other lakes through a series of streams and waterways, so it's an amazing place to do exactly what they were looking for. They rented some canoes and put them in the water, and off they paddled, headed out for the adventure that awaits. Just them in the endless forest, and a strange orb of light in the sky. Away from all the light pollution of the city, the skies up there beam with thousands of stars, and this was one of the early takeaways for this crew. They couldn't believe how awesome it was, and so they looked there often. On just the second night out there, Jim was hanging by the fire in the warm night air, and that's when he first saw it. A light in the sky only slightly bigger than the stars because it was closer to them. 
In his own words, he described the encounter. It was just floating above the treetops. It didn't seem to be moving in any direction. And I looked at it through the binoculars for maybe 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and it suddenly just winked out from the outside edges inward. I mean, it literally just went whoop like that, and it was gone. There was something about this thing that left me with an odd feeling that wasn't quite right, but I really didn't dwell on it. And he had pointed it out to the others who all witnessed the same thing too. It was certainly weird, but it also all happened very fast. The guys joked about how nobody was going to believe them, and that was kind of it. A weird encounter with no explanation, but no harm, no foul. Well, at least not yet. They hit the hay that night, and the following morning, the adventures continued on as planned. After some breakfast, the guys packed up and set out where they spent the day on the water, nothing to report from day three. But as the sun set on day four, they lit a large campfire at their new site, decided to do a little night fishing. They weren't going far from camp, just floating around the area, but it wasn't long after they hit the water that Chuck had an eerie feeling wash over him. He felt as if they were being watched. With their lines cast out, Chuck then looked over his right shoulder. That's when he saw a large, round globe of light. The same object they had seen just a few nights prior. Chuck described it to be like a miniature sun as the light seemed to have a rolling effect to it. It was unbelievably bright, lighting up the forest as if it were daytime. By now, they were all staring at it in complete disbelief. But the strangest thing above all else that stood out to them was that this orb was absolutely silent. With an object so large and so bright, naturally you just expect it to make some noise. Everything we make here on Earth that flies is loud. What they were witnessing stood out as beyond weird. And they realized what they were looking at was possibly a UFO from another planet, but what was it there for and what did it want? After looking for it for a few moments... The men staring at it, and it apparently staring back. Chuck grabbed his flashlight, named it towards the object before he flicked it on and off, sending out the signal for SOS. He wasn't sure exactly what he was trying to do other than communicate with it in some way. Immediately, the ball communicated back and began moving across the shoreline towards them, and that's when the real fear set in. Charlie said, When the light started coming towards us, my curiosity was satisfied, and I just dropped the flashlight. The only thought in my mind was to get to shore, and I never looked back. And suddenly this surreal experience was very real, and the survival instincts kicked in. Everyone hurriedly paddled towards their campsite. They could see the light getting harsher on their backs, knowing there was no way to outrun it. Back at shore, they looked up as the intense orb hovered above them. It was so close, they could have thrown a stone up and hit it. Then all of a sudden, it shot off into the night sky so fast that within a couple of seconds, it looked just like another star up there in the cosmos. The men had just experienced an amazing close encounter with some sort of unidentified object out there in the woods of Maine. However, something definitely didn't add up. Because instead of having adrenaline coursing through their veins, all of them were nice and relaxed. They were completely calm and there was no panic. All of them understood in that moment that they shouldn't be this calm and yet they were. 
While they all agreed they couldn't have been out on the water for more than 20 minutes, their bonfire, which should have roared for several hours, was now reduced to just ashes, as if much more time had gone by. And looking back, while they all remember being on the water and then back at their campsite looking up at the UFO as it streaked away, none of them actually recalled pulling up to shore. It was as if all of them had the same portion of time erased from their memories. What exactly happened during that time, they would find out eventually. In regards, though, to the rest of that evening, Jim said, The unusual thing is that we didn't stay up for hours and discuss this thing, which is what you'd think four young guys on a camping trip would do. We just seemed very fatigued and wanted to go to bed. The next morning, we got up and got our camp together and paddled to the next campsite. The four of them would go on to spend the next ten days camping, as they'd always planned to do. While they talked often about the experience, they never would see that ball light again. Back at home, they told of this wild encounter to many family and friends who mainly just brushed them off. These were creative guys, after all, so it sounded so insane that a lot of people figured it was some sort of prank or inside joke among the friends. And even if someone did believe them, at the end of the day, there was no solid proof of it happening, and so it just became a mysterious story that kind of faded away. And truthfully... As time passed by and the details of that day slowly chipped away, the four guys admittingly found the story hard to believe themselves. They'd question if this impossible scenario was possible. It was an enigma for them to wrap their heads around, and that's how it would stay for more than a decade. Until the nightmares and hypnosis. The guys graduated from school, got various jobs, and had their families, and life took over. They stopped talking about their encounter, except maybe with one another once in a while when they were having a beer or something. But Jim had a secret that he wouldn't reveal to any of the others until 12 years later in 1988. Jim had always had nightmares about that camping trip, and they were always focused on what they had experienced that day. Only, in these, there were additional details of something else happening that none of them seemed to remember. In these reoccurring nightmares, the four guys were all in a room, a sterile room, sitting naked on a bench while Jim himself was lying on a table with a device across his chest that kept him there. There was something for him, he had never seen it before, and surrounding them were beings of some sort for lack of a better term, aliens. They looked like humans and that they had the same general body shape, but they were the classic description of skinny, large heads and eyes with slits for mouths. Now, all that was scary enough, but what really made these terrifying for Jim were the emotions they brought out in them. If you've ever had a vivid nightmare, you may understand. Those ones you wake up from after seeing a loved one hurt or maybe yourself get hurt. Once you open your eyes, the thought sticks with you for a bit. And it can be scary. Jim in this room, naked with all his friends, being touched by these beings evoked a feeling of vulnerability and fear. No matter how much he didn't want to be there, he seemed stuck. And there was nothing any of them could do about it. But these nightmares were, after all, just that. They were spotty and unclear, and Jim just kept them to himself, because at first, they didn't occur all that often. But as time went on, they ramped up in frequency. When they used to happen maybe once a month, they began happening weekly, and then almost nightly. It was as if something was pushing them to the forefront of Jim's mind against his will. 
Eventually, he told his brother Jack about them and was apprehensive to do so. However, that's when Jack told him that he'd been having the exact same kind of nightmares. Now figuring there had to be more to their story as to what happened out on that lake, Jim reached out to a Massachusetts native named Ray Fowler, who had done a lot of work and research in the field of abductions and UFOs. Jim was looking for any sort of guidance on what they should do, fearing that these nightmares may actually be memories. Ray suggested that all four go under hypnosis separately, and that this would give them the best chance to compare their experiences, if there had even been one. Jim told the other guys about the plan, and they were all game. And Charlie and Chuck hadn't had dreams, but if their friends needed help, then they were there. And plus, something deep down in them told them there was something more to uncover. Once under hypnosis therapy, they all went on to describe eerily similar experiences that were just like Jim's nightmares. Being aboard a craft, in a room with otherworldly creatures, and being experimented on. In excerpts from those sessions, this is what each one of them had to say. From Jim, they're, they're, they don't know what to do. I think they think I'm going to come after them. I feel like I want to. I feel like I want to. The first one that comes near me, I'm going to throttle them. I don't like these things. I don't care where they come from. They shouldn't be doing this to people. From Jack. They're right there. Their face is right in my face. I don't know why. I don't want to know. I don't want to know what they want. They're saying things. In my head, they're saying, don't be afraid. They say, do what we say. Just do what we say. And from Charlie, it's like a doctor's office. I get that. It's cold, like a doctor's office is cold. They put the panel over your chest. Then they scrape your arms and your chest and your legs and your thighs. We shouldn't be here. I I just keep thinking... I want to be back in the canoe. And from Chuck, on seeing Charlie on the table, I see some sort of device on him. And they've got a, this looks like a silvery, it looks like the, like it got curves on it. It's almost like, like it sucks something. He got his head tipped way back. It's almost like he's in pain. And we're, we can't help him. All we can do is watch him. Having their artistic backgrounds, they then each drew up what they were recalling, and once again, they were all very similar looking. And skeptics, of course, said they all just planned this story beforehand, and that this was some sort of a plan to get fame and recognition. So the four of them did the only thing they really could, which was to take polygraph tests, where they were asked about if they had fabricated this tale, All of them said no, and all of them passed with flying colors. Their story was then thrust in the national spotlight. There were guests in the Joan Rivers show, and shortly after that, the Allagash Encounter was featured on the super popular show and one of my favorites of all time, Unsolved Mysteries. And it makes sense why it became so captivating to audiences. It had all the creepy and strange elements of a great movie. And four regular guys deep in the woods in Maine who see a ball of light. Memories erased only to recall what had actually happened more than a decade later after having been hypnotized and polygraphed. This encounter then became a part of the UFO zeitgeist and has stayed there ever since. 
but not without its controversies. Many skeptics focus on the use of hypnosis to recover memories of the abduction. It's widely acknowledged in the psychological community that hypnosis can create false memories or distort real ones, and so they argue that the similarities in the men's stories might result from the suggestive nature of hypnosis rather than from actual experiences. And the time gap between the incident and the hypnosis sessions, which was 12 years, is also a point of contention. And skeptics suggest that the men's memories could have been influenced by other factors over the years, including media portrayals of alien abductions. Many wondered if they were on drugs like hallucinogens, but all the men claim, other than some beers and weed, they were straight. This definitely wasn't an experience induced by drugs. People have also often questioned the motivations behind the claims themselves. They point out that the men gained significant media attention and some financial benefits from their story, suggesting that this could have been a motive for fabrication. The men's backgrounds in art might have equipped them with the creative skills to concoct a compelling story. On the other side, some ufologists and believers in extraterrestrial phenomena consider the Allagash incident as a significant case. They argue that the detailed accounts given under hypnosis and the emotional impact on the individuals involved lend credence to the authenticity of their experience. They also point out that the consistency in the abduction narratives across different individuals suggest a shared experience rather than individually fabricated stories. So in the end, it's really up for you to decide what you want to believe. Interestingly, around 2016, Chuck came out and said the whole story was fabricated. Now, he didn't say it was a straight-up hoax start to finish, but alluded to the fact that it wasn't real. He said, We were compelled to stay together, all speculating that this thing could go into the millions of dollars for each of us. We made very little. However, the other three claim that Chuck is just saying this because over the years he's had some problems. Fultz described Chuck as a man with a violent temper who's been banned from some UFO conventions and he said, we definitely steer clear of him because the guy's a loose cannon and a mental disaster area. So, having felt like he had been pushed away by his three friends, they say this is just his way of getting back at them. So, real or fake, it's hard to know for sure. The Allagash abduction straddles the line between reality and the unknown. It raises some questions about the nature of memory itself, and the power of the subconscious, and the vast, unexplored mysteries of the universe, of course. And whether a true encounter with the extraterrestrial or a psychological phenomenon, the Allagash incident is a haunting and unresolved mystery that at the end of the day, the next time you're out camping and you look up at the stars, it'll be a story that crosses your mind. So that's it for this week's episode of Every Town. Thanks for tuning in today. And please do subscribe, click the notification so we can reach you more easily with all the content we're putting out each week. And please do come back soon for another episode filled with scary, strange, and mysterious stories. Because you never know, maybe your town will be next. <laughs>